Okay. So, hello, I'm Guy Wolf, and in this episode, I'm talking to Charlotte Bentz, the low pay, no pay, and independent theatre organiser for equity, about your rights at work and what you should expect from an equity contract. Thanks, Charlotte. Hi. Hello, thanks for coming on. Um, That's so quite all right. Shall we start with what rights do equity members have at work? Yeah. Um, one of the things I think it's important to start with when thinking about your rights at work is that the rights that you have when you're at work depend on what your status is when you're at work. And I don't mean your status in terms of, you know, your position in the company or whatever. I mean your status for employment rights purposes. Now, one of the sort of common misconceptions i think is that people assume that because the overwhelming majority of people in the entertainment industry are self-employed for tax and national insurance purposes there's this assumption that people must automatically be self-employed for employment employment rights purposes as well um, but that isn't actually true now you can be self-employed for tax and national insurance purposes as everybody is um, but your status for employment rights can be different. And for our actor and stage manager members in particular, um, that is more likely to be different than it is for directors and designers or variety artists, for example. Right. So whilst if you're self-employed, there are kind of, for tax and national insurance purposes, there are kind of two categories. You can either be an employee, um, which is where you're generally paid through PAYE, pay as you earn, you know, you get taxed at source, that sort of thing, or self-employed. For employment's right, employment rights purposes, there's a third category, kind of in between employee and self-employed, and that is the category of worker. Um, and our stage manager and actor, dancer, performer members, for employment rights purposes, will fall under the category of worker. Now, it's important that people bear that in mind because a lot of the time what people do is go on to the um, HMRC website and have a look at, you know, what is my status? And it will tell them that they're self-employed. That's because there are only those two statuses for tax and national insurance purposes, but there are three for employment rights. So make sure you understand that there can be a difference between your status for tax and your status for rights at work. Now, when you are a worker, um, and I'm going to talk more about how you determine whether you're a worker or you're self-employed, because one of the things that people have to understand is just because a contract might say that you're self-employed, it doesn't automatically mean that you are self-employed because you can't just slap a label on a contract and then that's it, it's fixed. The status for employment rights purposes is not determined by whatever the engager decides to write in the contract. It's determined by the reality of the job. So I'm going to right. talk a bit more about that in a bit because it's, it's quite a difficult thing to, for people to get their head around, yeah. but it's also fundamental to understanding what you might be entitled to. So when you are classified as a worker for the purposes of employment rights, you are entitled to the national minimum wage. Um, the national minimum wage goes up in April every year and it is the legal minimum that you can earn for every hour that you spend at work. So it's um, it, it does break down in terms of um, the hours that you work, not as a sort of average. So for every hour that you work, you have to earn at least that figure. And from the 1st of April 2020, um, that figure is £8.72 per hour if you are over 25. Now, equity doesn't believe it's right that there are different rates for different um, age categories but one of the things that George Osborne did when he was Chancellor was introduce different rates of pay for different age groups so the £8.72 is if you're 25 and over mm -hmm. 21 to 24 year olds it's £8.20 um, 18 to 20 year olds it's £6.45 and under 18 it's £4.55 in all the agreements equity signs and in reality mostly it's me that signs agreements on the fringe we don't have differentials in age for what people can be paid everybody has to have at least um, the national minimum wage and everybody has the same rate irrespective of um, what age they are because we don't think it's right that people should be paid less for doing the same job just because they happen to be um, you know 
21 instead younger, of 25 yeah. for example yeah it's not it's not right it's not fair um so that's right number one for workers the national minimum wage yeah the second thing to bear in mind is rest breaks um so there's there's a legislation that comes from the eu called the working time directive and that working time directive puts limits on how much time in a week you can spend at work um, it says that you have to have you are entitled to a certain break overnight in between shifts and that has to be 11 hours so for example you couldn't finish at um 10 o'clock at night for example and be called back into work at 8 a.m the next morning because you have to have your 11 hour break overnight um, the working time regulations say that you can work no more than 48 hours in any given week averaged out over the contract now when that legislation came in from europe one of the things that our government did at the time was think about how they could get people to work more than the 48 hours a week the the european union says should be the maximum so in this country, we have what's called an opt out. So people can opt out of only working 48 hours a week. Um, although quite why you'd want to do that, you know, I have no idea because 48 hours a week is a lot. Yeah. Um, but in this country, you can opt out, out of that. The other rights that you have are um, protection against less favourable treatment if you make a disclosure in the public interest. A lot of the time that's called whistleblowing and it doesn't really apply in this industry that much. But when it does, it's important to know that people have um, people have those rights. Right. You are also protected by the Equality Act 2010. Now, the Equality Act was the um, like a major piece of legislation in this country that brought together previous equality legislation into one act so it combined the legislation that existed for for women for black and minority ethnic people for disabled people into one act to ensure that people were not able to be discriminated against um, or suffer detrimental treatment because they had what's called a protected characteristic something like um, race or disability that could result in unfavorable treatment you have that right not to be discriminated against on the basis of any protected characteristic you might have um, that act obviously also applies in wider life in wider society but it's important that people understand that it also applies at work so you know your boss or your producer can't say something to you that is um, sexist or racist or discriminatory against you on the grounds of your sexuality or disability um, because you have legislation that protects you from that. Right. Um, you also have the right to receive a pay slip and this is an important one because when you are a worker you should be given a summary of what you've earned that week and what um, what that represents you know so right, how yeah. many hours you've worked or whatever the flat weekly rate is and how that breaks down into what you're being what you're being given and that gives you the ability to make sure that you're being paid the right rate and that's particularly important when you're working for smaller sums of money because you want to make sure that you're getting every penny and pound that you're entitled to you also have rights um, to holiday pay so again the working time regulations the legislation that governs how much time you can work in a week also governs your right to have paid time off um, from your work. Now, the reality in this industry for most of our members is that although you are entitled to paid time off, you're not going to get it in the course of the play or project that you're doing because you know our contracts tend to be quite small and the legislation is aimed really, um, you know, and it's most easy to understand format, the legislation is more aimed at people who are in longer term contracts, um, you know, in fixed sort of nine to five or steady jobs for longer periods of time. But what the legislation gives our members is the right to be paid for holiday that they accrue in the course of their engagement that they're not able to take. They take, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you will have that right to holiday. You won't be able to, you might not be able to take it in the contract that you're doing. Yeah. but you would get paid for the holiday entitlement that you've built up but not been able to take because you were not able to take it and right. you can see um on your screen now that guide in the equity fringe agreement of how to calculate holiday pay yeah. is a really important bit of information for people um you know knowing how 
to make sure that you get what you're entitled to in terms of holiday pay is really important. And what I would say is that just because it might not say in a contract that you're entitled to holiday pay doesn't mean that you aren't entitled to it. Um, you know, if you are classified as a worker for the purposes of employment rights, you have that entitlement to holiday pay and therefore it is due to you because it's a statutory right and that's not something that you can waive in any contract that you've signed. So if you were to get a contract through that made no mention of holiday pay, what steps would you take? Would you, if you didn't want to um, confront your employer personally, what steps could you take? Well, I mean, I would always advise people to ask the question um, either through your agent, if you have one, or doing it yourself, if you feel comfortable. Just say, you know, I, I noticed that there isn't um, an entitlement to holiday pay mentioned in the contract. Yeah. Will that be calculated and paid at the end of the engagement or how's that going to work? And then see how it you see how the conversation goes. And I understand a lot of the time that people are quite nervous about having those conversations with producers because, you know, people may not want to be seen as a troublemaker or being difficulties or whatever but yeah. that holiday pay is a statutory right and it can't be taken away from you right. and you are able to enforce those statutory rights after the contract is finished so if you before you sign it you raise questions about your entitlement to holiday pay and the answer that you get isn't satisfactory there is nothing to stop you raising that entitlement again at the end of the engagement once it's finished. And a lot of the time what happens is that people will contact the union for advice on holiday pay when they're about to sign a contract, then decide that they might not want to do anything about it while the engagement is ongoing, but then come back to us when it's finished and say, I still haven't had my holiday pay, can you help me? And then we can take over um, and get in touch with the producer and explain the entitlement and make sure it gets paid. And does holiday pay um, apply to any contract, even no. if, if it were a, a day commercial or two day commercial or something like that? What's oh, I see what you mean. Yes, holiday pay does apply to every contract. <laughs> I thought you meant does it apply to contracts for people like directors and designers or the general oh, right. employed. Um, but it does apply to every contract if you're a worker. Um, right, yeah. which again performers and stage manager members of the union are 99.9% .9 of the time should be correctly classified as workers and um, holiday pay is a right that accrues from day one so even if you've done a one or two day long engagement you are still accruing holiday pay entitlements over those one or two days because it starts from the minute you turn up at work the minute you've got your um you know, the minute there's money paid for a job to be done, when you're categorised as a worker, you have that entitlement. So even if it is only a short engagement and therefore a short entitlement, you should still be getting it. Right. And just for anyone, if they are uh, watching this, you can find this guide on the equity website. It's the Professionally Made, Professionally Paid, a guide to combating low pay and no pay work in the entertainment industry. And it also has a... Um, template of a, a contract as well so um yeah yeah so that's so th th those uh we've been through the right text we've got the national minimum wage rest breaks protection for whistleblowing equality act pay slips and holiday pay uh, i'll stop share now are there any others charlotte that we uh have missed out yeah i mean one of the things that i think people don't um always consider a lot of the time but again is really important um is the question of health and safety Mm. and the obligation that the person who's engaging you for the work has towards your health and your safety whilst you're at work for them. Um, you will find lots of information about health and safety at work on the union's website. Now, what we would expect is that there is some sort of written statement or policy for your health and safety, which isn't always necessarily going to be included in a contract, but should be provided or presented um, when you turn up at work. It should be visible within the building or a copy mm -hmm. should be provided to you when you start, depending on how, on how long the engagement is. Now, a lot of the time, producers will be you know, renting a venue from somebody else, um, which means that they will have to abide by the health and safety policy of the venue that so, you're yeah. working in. Um, and that's fine, but what is, what is important is that people know that their health and safety has been considered and that people are aware that they have those rights um, for their engager to take their health and safety seriously. And it's important to note as well that when you're genuinely self-employed, 
you also have a right for your health and safety to be considered. Mm. So the genuinely self-employed for the purposes of employment rights have no entitlement to the national minimum wage or lots of the other things that we've just talked about, but they do have the right for their health and safety to be considered properly. And they do have the right to be protected from any discrimination in the workplace as well. I guess this links to the question of like the protection over whistleblowing. Uh, if you felt like your health and safety was being jeopardised at work and wanted to make, to raise that issue, and again didn't feel like you could confront your employer with it, what what steps would you would you recommend taking? Um, I, if you wanted to raise an issue about health and safety, or if you wanted to um, make a disclosure under whistleblowing legislation, you should always seek advice from the union beforehand because health and safety matters can be quite complicated. Um, you know, a lot of the liability for health and safety lies with the employer and the responsibility for assessing health and safety lies with the local authority, the council, and with the health and safety executive, depending on the type of venue and depending on the severity of the health and safety issue that you want to raise. Um, so if you have got health and safety concerns about a venue, it's always worth contacting your union organiser because we will be able to talk you through the specifics um, and any background information. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, well, that seems pretty comprehensive. Um, I suppose the next question is when you receive a contract, what do you think are the main things that people should be looking for okay um so when i first started this job i got into a bit of i don't want to say trouble because it wasn't quite trouble a pickle um, but i really a bit of a pickle, bit of a pickle. Um, <laughs> bit of a pickle because i really upset um a group of equity members working on a non-union contract who had an issue with what they'd signed when they were working on the job because I asked them why they hadn't looked at their contracts before they started the job. Um, and the answer was, I have an agent to do all of that for me. Why am I bothering looking at my contracts? That's why I pay my agent. And that's true. Um, and I had upset this particular group of equity members or annoyed this particular group of equity members, I should say, by suggesting that they shared in that responsibility with their agent to ensure that they knew what they were being signed up to. Mm. Um, you know, their view understandably was, well, I pay my agent. What's it's the point in an agent? agent. What's yeah. the point? What's the, literally, what is the point in an agent if yeah. I can't rely on them to look at this contract for me and see what's what? But the point that I made in response was that, you know, yes, that is why you pay your agent, but it's not your agent that's doing the job. It's right. you that's doing the job and you therefore need to know broadly what terms and conditions you're signing up to. Yeah. And if you've got any queries about those terms and conditions to be able to discuss them with your agent or with the union, if you don't have representation to make sure you know exactly what it is you're signing up to, because sometimes contracts can be really quite difficult to read yeah. and people people feel put off by going through them or people don't want to read it because it's boring and it's you know why you pay your agent whatever but I really do recommend that even if you have got an agent look at your own contracts as well and there's a right. few a few kind of headline things that you should be looking at number one is things is the rate of pay yeah um so I mentioned earlier that people when they're classified as workers for the purposes of employment rights people have that right to the national minimum wage um but what is what are you being paid and what for um you know does it specify if your job includes other responsibilities for example particularly in um fringe work or in the independent sector for example you may be contracted as one thing but also be required to undertake other duties in the production at certain times right so are you clear on what those other duties might be is it outlined in the contract and they give you an example so small scale touring for example you co you're contracted as an actor but under the rate of pay section, it will also say that you're responsible for, I don't know, driving, driving the van, the, yeah, assisting unloading, with the get yeah. in and get out and all that sort of stuff. So make sure you know how much you're being paid and what that rate of pay is actually buying yeah. and make sure you're happy that the wage as, as described is A, at least equivalent to the national minimum wage for every hour that you work and B, 
that you understand exactly what your duties are for the amount of money you're being paid yeah the other the second thing is the hours of work um how many hours will you be working in a day how many hours will you be working in a week how many days in a week what time is your working day going to begin and when does it end are you going to be given breaks when are those breaks how regular are those breaks going to be and make sure that all of that is clear because a lot of the time you know there might be vagaries in the contract around you know you'll get breaks this is we'll be working sort of roughly these times but you need to ensure that there aren't going to be any nasty surprises right when you've signed a contract that says um you know vague things about your hours of work and then your producer is perfectly entitled to say well no actually we do start at 7 a.m because <laughs> you've signed a contract that yeah. says we do um, and so agent make sure you... reads how many contracts it's, it's the yeah. kind of thing that an agent could easily overlook and in terms of those rate those breaks we've you mentioned the 11 hour breaks between shifts on top of that i, I believe is it the three hours three hour call is the mat without a break that's the maximum is that right well it depends on what contract you're working on so obviously in the um in the union agreements you have better break entitlements that you are entitled to by statute right under the working time regulations which apply to every sector of the economy and every industry you have the right to an uninterrupted break of at least 20 minutes if you work more than six hours in a day right okay and that's the statutory position anything else is better than that now obviously we think that people should get better than that which is why we negotiate better than that in the union agreements because we don't think it's reasonable to ask people to do for example um intensely physical work for six, for hours, six hours with only a 20 with only a 20 minute break that's not reasonable right. but that is the basic statutory position every six hours you work a 20 minute break and it's important to note as well that that break does not have to be paid because that okay, break does yeah. not count as working time um so that again make sure that you're looking yeah. at that cool. yeah as long as it's uninterrupted it's not working time right. but if you're over there having your lunch and then you're told you've got to do something then that becomes working time again Right. But make sure you're looking at the hours in the contract and what the breaks are and what are the penalties for when you miss breaks. You know, in a lot of the union agreements, particularly in tech week, for example, in theatre, um, people will miss breaks. Our stage management members regularly work through their breaks. Directors right. regularly work through breaks because, you know, one of the things that director members will tell us is that lots of other people on the production use the tea break as their opportunity to go and speak to the director. Right, yeah, so exactly. the direct, Yeah, so the director isn't the getting her break. Yeah, yeah the yeah, director yeah. isn't getting her break. So in the contract, what are the penalties for when your breaks are missed? How will you be compensated either by further time off later down the line or by payment in the, you know, by way of compensation for missing that break? Right. Um, that leads me on to overtime. Mm -hmm. you know when we've when you've looked at the hours you're going to be working mm -hmm. in the week like the maximum hours you're going to be working in a week how what are you going to be paid if you work over those hours so if the contract says you're going to be paid i don't know 500 pounds a week for a 40 hour week what happens in those weeks where you work 46 hours for example mm -hmm. how much additional payment are you going to get are you going to be entitled to any additional payment so make sure you look at overtime provisions as well, because that, you know, for stage management members, the question of overtime is, is crucial. Um, and it's very important for other members as well. But stage management teams obviously regularly work overtime and therefore need to pay really, really close attention to those um, provisions. And are those, so we've mentioned there briefly directors and how their breaks can be uh, hindered massively. What about designers? Are there any kind of differences there for our designer members? Well, uh, the things that creative teams should look for um, in the contract would be different because their their working patterns tend to be different. Now, the director obviously has that period in the rehearsal room where the working pattern is similar. Um, but for the designer, the work will look quite different. The things that designers and directors should be looking for, in particular in contracts, are things around the future life of the work. Right. So if the show is if the if the work is revived, what are the director or designers rights under that revival? Um, does the director, for example, have first refusal on being able to um, direct the second part of the show? 
what payment is the designer going to get in the event that the work is transferred or sold or whatever. Um, but on the question of what else to look for in a contract, there's also things, you know, you should look at health and safety. Is there anything in there on health and safety and how that will be looked after? Um, a, a really important one is things about dignity at work. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously equity has done a lot of work recently on the question of safe spaces and how to make sure that all of us have the right to be in workplaces and in environments where we're treated with respect, um, irrespective of our gender or any other protected characteristic about us. How is your engager taking that seriously? Mm. What policies and procedures do they have in place to ensure that if you have a problem and if something goes wrong at work, um, you know, from a dignity and respect point of view, how are you going to be supported for that to be resolved? And what are the procedures and steps that the, um, the producer will take? Now, I wouldn't expect an entire dignity at work policy to be included in a contract, but I would expect there to be reference in the contract to the fact that these policies exist and you will be provided with a copy. Um, things like sick leave, what happens to you if you get injured or you're, or you're too unwell to work? Are you going to be get are you going to be getting any sick pay? Um, is there going to be any filming? Is the show going to be filmed? If it's going to be filmed, what is it going to be filmed for? And how will your rights to that be protected? Yeah. You know, if it's for commercial purposes, if the work is, if the film is sold, how are you going to benefit from the selling of that work? Um, if it's for non-commercial purposes what are the limitations on that so you know most people will film a production once for archive purposes yeah. and we wouldn't expect any additional payment to performers and stage managers for one film for an archive but if they're filming it to sell then yes we would expect additional payments and the union agreements would give you rights to additional payments under those under those terms and presumably um, there's there's things about being properly credited as well there must be some yeah and again particularly important for director designer members yeah. you know how are their names going to appear um in any publicity when images of their work are shared on social media how is the fact that they are the lighting designer or set designer or whatever going to be credited to them? That's massively important for yeah. creative team members. Um, there's also things around touring allowance and subsistence. You know, if you're on tour, what arrangements are being made for accommodation and for food? What other allowances are you going to receive? You know, what um, if you're required to travel, who's booking that travel? Are you doing it? Is there a van? Are you going to have to pay for your own train tickets in advance? Like what, what are the arrangements and how will those payments reach you? So it's really important that people follow that checklist and it's quite an in-depth checklist, but you have to have a look at all of these things to make sure you know what you're signing up for. And yeah, your agent will do most of it for you if you've got one, but if you haven't, you can always contact the union and somebody like me or depending on the sector or the nation or region of the UK, um, one of my colleagues will be able to help you as well. Right. That's brilliant. Um, that you kind of answer the next question, really, which is where can people go for help? Yeah, us. Um, a big part of our job, <laughs> a big part of our job is helping people understand their contracts. Yeah. Um, and also helping you to negotiate better in your contracts, because if you don't have an agent, you know, that process of negotiating better in your contracts is going to fall to you. Now, there are times when we can take that on for you. Um, you know, if you send us a contract and we think that there's some issues with it, such as, you know, payment below the national minimum wage or like, to go back to the earlier example, no mention of holiday pay, for example, we can quite easily contact contact the producer on your behalf and say, look, we've had, you know, we've heard that this is what it says in your contracts. We need to have a conversation about that. But if you'd rather do it yourself, we can help you figure out what to say. Um, and there's also a load of really good resources on the Federation of Entertainment Unions website yeah. around negotiation skills, which if you're an equity member, you can access for free. So I'd encourage people to have a look at that, particularly if you don't have an agent who can do the negotiating for you. Um, you know, make sure that you know how to do it because there will be times in your career where you're going to have to um but yeah if you need help come to the union that's why we're here and uh, so you know equity's role in all of this like you say it's 
uh, on the website, there's loads of information and speaking to staff members like yourself. Um, but what if there was a, a non-equity contract? What if you're an equity member working on, because we know of so much, and not necessarily uh, bad practice, but a lot of practices that aren't necessarily covered by a union contract. What would you recommend in those cases? Well, I, I mean, it depends on the situation because sometimes members working on non-equity contracts will get in touch with us. We will contact the producer who will then say, oh, I had no idea I could use an equity agreement. Great. How do I turn this into something that's approved by the union? Um, and then we're able to have a conversation about how we can turn the agreement the member has been offered into something better you know, i.e. a union agreement, whether that's one of the industry standard agreements that we've got or a house agreement with that particular producer. So, you know, that happens quite a lot because members will get in touch and just say, look, I'm a bit uneasy about this. Can you can you advise or can you make great. an equity contract? Yeah. yeah. Um, we can also, our role in this is also obviously the negotiation of your wider terms and conditions of employment. Um, so whether that's with UK Theatre or with Salt or the IT, ITC, um, or across recorded media, there are a number of producers who look at those collective agreements that we've got as a benchmark for their own. So they might not necessarily be using full union agreements, but they will look at the union agreement as a reference point and have a relationship with us whereby we can ring them up and say, look, we've got concerns about this. Can you, you need to more closely follow the industry standard or we think you need to do this differently. So the union's role is multifaceted here because to start with, we're negotiating the industry standards, the best practice terms and conditions. And then we're also helping other people enforce them and understand them better um, and encouraging as many producers as possible to use those industry standard agreements so that members know what they're signing up to and what they can expect. Mm. And in those cases where, let's say, it is... Uh, what is being offered is in your low pay, no pay remit. Um, what would you recommend there? Get in touch. I mean, yeah, what I would say is that a lot of the time people will be offered work that's for less than the national minimum wage. Profit share. Um, or profit share or whatever. And they will want to do it for various reasons. And one of the things that I say quite a lot to members who have questions about this is, you know, I'm not your mum. I'm not here to tell you what decisions are right for you to make in your career you know i know that equity members we as a union know that equity members will do profit share productions or work that pays them below the national minimum wage for a whole variety of reasons mm. and those decisions around doing that work are yours to make not ours our job is to make sure that when you do that kind of work that breaches your statutory rights that you know exactly what you're doing and also, just because you may have agreed to do work for less than the national minimum wage, for example, doesn't mean that that entitlement to the national minimum wage has gone away. So sometimes what happens is that people will agree to do a profit share. Um, they'll be given some sort of vague figures around the kind of sums that they may hope to end up with at the end of the project. Those sums will ultimately not materialize or people will have a bad experience or it wasn't what they were promised or whatever or it's enough and to buy were... a round of drinks on the last yeah, night. yeah 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 and then people can still come to us and say look i did this job i believe i should have been paid the national minimum wage can you help me yes mm. we can you know people have a right to enforce those statutory rights such as the national minimum wage after the contract is finished and we have you know we have been able to support members to recoup their entitlements to the national minimum wage um, even when they've signed up to do profit shares or accepted less than the national minimum wage for their work. And I suppose even then, you know, with, with what you were saying about your, your general other rights, it's not just about finances, it's not just about your pay. If, if a producer or a venue, for whatever reason, isn't offering what you should be getting financially, they should be offering a lot of those other things, like your health and safety, uh, you know, be, proper... Um, uh, dignity at work and all those other yeah. things that you've been talking about um, yeah. I mean I think one of the issues that I encounter a lot of the time and I think the other equity officials would agree with me on this is the idea from some producers and employers in this sector of a sort of entertainment industry exceptionalism whereby the legislation around pay around health and safety, around hours at work, around dignity at work, is all something that's fine and dandy for people who work in shoe shops or offices 
or the local garage or whatever but there is this nonsense belief in some quarters that all of those rights and protections that apply to every other sector of the economy somehow don't exist or are relevant for the entertainment industry so a lot of the time we will have to have arguments with producers about yes the national minimum wage is a thing in this industry it's mm -hmm. a thing for all workers um so yeah people can absolutely come to us and we will we will help make sure that people understand that those rights exist because you know it is far it is easier for a bad employer to take your rights away from you if you don't know what those rights are right because in order for you to enforce your right to the national minimum wage or to holiday pay you have to know that those rights apply and if you don't know that those rights apply you're never going to enforce them so a big part of the union's role is not just like the promotion and the protection of workers rights it's also letting our members know that these things exist and educating people about the fact that these rights exist and are there to be enforced because if people don't know that they've got rights they won't use them because i meet so many equity members who think that people have got no rights at all in this right. industry yeah. but you have you just have to know about them and that's why things like this are important in terms of getting that message out about those rights that exist to as many members as possible and i guess the moral of the story is in order to benefit from all of these things you should probably be an equity member yeah, the moral of the story is join your union because your union doesn't just do all of the kind of individual send us your contract and we'll help you stuff. It also does the collective work as well in terms right. of the lobbying of government for better positions, the working with um, industry management associations to negotiate collective terms and conditions. You know, your union membership is that individual investment in the collective idea that the industry can be better and the union is the vehicle for making that change you know so the moral of the story here absolutely is join your union but this the kind of subsection moral if you like if that's even a thing is use your union it is now i've coined it there we go. <laughs> yeah, take it um you know the, the the kind of subsection moral is use your union you right, know if you have you, questions yeah. or you have concerns about a contract that you've been offered you should get in touch with us right. and we will help because that's why you know that's why the union has staff this is our job um so if in any doubt about anything that you're asked to sign if you don't understand it if you want to check that if you want to check that what you're being asked to sign is okay people can contact us and sometimes i hear from members who are like a bit bashful because maybe they think that the question they're asking me is really basic and they should know um, or that somehow it's a waste of my time. Like none of those things are true. Even if people think that the question they want to ask is really basic, like one, I can guarantee that I will have been asked it before. <laughs> yeah. And two, I can guarantee that I will have been asked more basic questions because nobody knows this stuff. And it's our job as your union to help you learn it, figure it out, and remember that you have got rights and you can stand up for them as hard yeah. as that might sometimes seem well that's brilliant um thank you so much charlotte that uh, is all right us through that um and that's that's well i say this is our first young members podcast it kind of technically is but we're actually doing one at six so which oh, yeah we've, first we've... yes on your like pension um pension to be proud of campaign with will attenborough um and sam swan so yeah but should, just should we say that we're looking forward to that or sh given that this is coming out after you know, we, we, we say should, that it was really it was, good it was so good like yeah, really, it was great. really so great much discussion. out of it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, it was amazing <laughs> um, thank you so much charlotte and no um, yeah we'll speak to you soon uh thanks for nice listening one. to the young members podcast